Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Catalyst Funding Real Estate Market Update. It is March 2023, and we want to bring you all the latest updates on the real estate investment marketing, real estate investment market. And as always, we have our Catalyst industry experts with us today is Catalyst founder and CEO Wade Como. And then we have the Catalyst Director of Lending, Jeff Johnson. Hello. Now, each time we do this market update, we have a special guest we're happy to um, bring to you from Priority Settlement Group of Texas, Priority Title, Marcus Overhu. And I'm going to let Wade introduce Thank our special guest me. today. Yeah, um, we, we really enjoy all of our guests, but what Marcus is a special guest, he's been our primary title company I think for six years now, um, we, we use them every opportunity that we have. Um, his group is outstanding, very quick, their delivery, quick to respond. And if there is a challenge, they're experts at getting those things fixed. And with any relationship, every once in a while, we might have a challenge that we need to talk through. But I can tell you that Marcus and his team are incredibly responsive. They always get it handled very quickly. And they've just been excellent partners, a big part of our growth, honestly. Uh, over the past six years. So uh, I can't give them any more uh, high compliments. And if you guys have an opportunity to select your title company, I definitely encourage you guys to give the priority team and Marcus and his squad a, a chance for sure. Yeah, I just want to second that. Um, like Wade said, they, you know, when we when we do have the opportunity to use title, they always deliver quick. Um, without much drama at all, it's right there. Um, but then also, like Wayne said, when there is something that's going on, like there's no, Marcus and his team, like Marcus especially and, and his guy, Michael, like they they hop on problems within the minutes, not hours or days. Like you get a response from these guys right away. So I cannot say enough good things about um, the priority team. Um, and if you are a wholesaler or an agent, and you have not used priority, I highly suggest you give them a shot on your next deal or two um, so you can experience what we experience um, all the time. Great. Couldn't say enough good things about it. Awesome. Thanks for giving those intros. And uh, what I'm going to do is give a little disclaimer and then I'll get off of here so that our experts can get to this market update, all the knowledge you've been waiting for, the latest news from the real estate investment market. But the disclaimer is that this presentation is for general information only and that no information presented here, uh, presented by our experts, presented on our presentation, um, if you um, influence your investment performance, um, we're not held liable is basically what we're saying. We want this to be beneficial to you, but we um, do not hold any liability for any loss or damage you may incur for the information contained here. So with that disclaimer, I'll move right on to the slides that we've talked about, talking about Marcus, and then with Wade and Jeff as well, and jump right into our market update. Perfect, thank you, Derek. And Marcus, I wanna give you an opportunity to, to tell everybody a little bit about what you do, and if you have any exciting updates going on, uh, anything with priority you wanna make the, our, our uh, viewers and listeners aware of. Yeah, no, for, first of all, uh, thank you guys so much for, for that nice introduction there. I'm glad that the light is coming from the side and not the front. So, so me blushing wasn't as obvious on the camera as, it, as it, I'm sure it was. So, but absolutely fantastic partnership. Love working with you guys, and you know the same sentiments towards towards you and your team. You guys are a great partner to work with. So, thank you. Um, I'm the president of Priority Settlement Group. Uh, I manage. Uh, there's Priority Title and Escrow, which uh, really handles the other 49 states in the country. So, we have a national division. And I'm the president of our Texas division. Uh, and we started in 2016, November, uh, in that month of that year. And we've done really a lot of cool things. Uh, we've expanded our office space into San Antonio, into Houston, headquartered out of Austin. We have an office in, in Colleen, Harker Heights. Uh, and then hopefully by the end of this year or early next year, we'd like to be in the Dallas uh, Fort Worth area as well. Um, a lot of success, you know, the pandemic was, was, you know, certainly wild from a volume perspective, the, the rate environment that we were in. So we really, really grew. And, you know, now our focus is on, on very, very heavy, always has been on the purchase market. And so we're really strategically hiring some really, really quality escrow officers in those markets that we're in. 
um, to really provide an incredible service solution uh, to our clients out there. And, and, you know, Jeff and Wade saying that there's a passion that comes with priority uh, towards providing exceptional service. It's not just words. It's what we believe in. Uh, we are a vendor to the real estate industry, and our job is to service that industry to the best of our ability. So I always thank our clients for allowing us to help them and service them through their needs. Um, and to get to work with people like Jeff, Wade, and, and Derek is always fantastic. So that's me in a nutshell. Great. Um, well, we are going to dive into the presentation. If we could grab the next slide. Um, a quick overview for those of you that do not know, we are a one-stop shop for hard money and permanent financing loans. Um, we're real estate lenders built by real estate investors. Many of the people on our team and, and I myself are real estate investors. So we try to take that uh, knowledge and the mistakes we've made and help you uh, learn from those as well so we can help you avoid uh, losses and maximize returns. It's very important to us to be a trusted advisor to the people we work with. We've been involved in thousands of transactions over the years. We average five-star uh, uh, reviews on both uh, Facebook and Google and all other social media outlets. Um, we focus on a, lot, a wide variety of long-term loans, as I mentioned earlier, both conventional and non-conventional. We have a wide variety of 30-year fixed, no income doc, landlord type loans. We also are, are really good. Our team is really good at primary refi purchase and cash outs to fuel your real estate investment. Those cash outs are really big. I know rates are a little bit higher right now, but we're going to talk about the opportunities that are in the market. And they're so compelling that even if you increase, increase your interest rate on your primary mortgage, it makes a lot of sense. And, um, we also have nine QM. If you want to get involved in real estate investing at the moment, but you haven't found a solution to do it, we do have nine qualified mortgage loans with FICOs as low as 620. And that's an excellent vehicle if you have had some credit issues to get into the market and own real estate, take advantage of all the wonderful advantages that come from owning real estate over the long run. Um, that said, we'll, we'll kick it right off. Jeff, you want to start with this next slide? Sure. So um, we talk a lot about migration trends. Um, this was a great chart we found um, through February 2023. It lists, um, if you look at the states or the, the map, it's like a heat map. Um, the or, you know, red to yellow and orange are states where people are coming to. And then the blue uh, are where they're leaving. Um, you know, not a lot of surprises if you just kind of look in general terms basically from Tennessee down North Carolina all the way to Arizona through Nevada the southern states are getting a massive uh, influx and the majority of the folks leaving are California New York East Coast um, the I'll read the little note down here at the bottom and then I want to talk about the areas so nationwide 25 percent of home buyers searched to move to a different metro area between 2022 and 2023 the top five states home buyers searched to move to were Florida, Texas, Arizona, Tennessee, and South Carolina, while California, New York, DC, Illinois, and Massachusetts were the top five states home buyers searched to move from. Um, I, I looked up, I did a little research on it because the 25% doesn't really mean anything unless you have some context. That is a significantly higher number than it used to be in the past, meaning when people would move, they weren't always moving to other states. Um, but I think a lot of the reasons why people move were different. Um, it used to be, it was almost always work was the number one reason by a, by a lot. Now it's more so being near family, um, you know, politics, taxes, stuff like that. Um, they were much more prevalent now than they used to be. Um, and then I look at the, the, the cities, uh, and if you look to the right there, these are the top 10 cities, you know, Miami, Phoenix, Vegas, Sacramento, which is a California city, um, was in the top four, actually. So a lot of folks are moving to Sacramento uh, and then Tampa and on down the list. And you got Dallas was eight and uh, Houston was 10. But if you look, one, two, three, four, five, seven of the top 10 cities were in two states, Texas and Florida. So um, a lot of what we've been talking about, just this migration to the south. Um, which is nothing but good things for um, real estate investors down here in Texas. 
Yeah, that, that's why we're covering this data is we're trying to present uh, an evaluation of the Texas market as a whole, if you're considering real estate investing. And while you may hear some things that are not positive and in a market like this, there are, there are some data that are less than positive. At the end of the day, one of the things that we think really uh, paint a rosy outlook for the future in the state of Texas, and especially the major metros um, of uh, you know, Dallas and Houston and San Antonio, and still to a certain extent, Austin, although they did get a little bit overheated, um, at the end of the day, it's because of this migration. So many people are moving to the area and you're not able to build enough homes to support that. So that's one of the big reasons we feel real estate investment is very geographic and you need to look at particular areas in which you want to invest and not just look at national data. Marcus, what are you seeing about uh, Texas as a whole since you guys have such a wide uh, coverage in the state? Yeah, and I'll tell you from my own experience, you know, um, it was in the in my introduction there earlier, I'm, I'm born and raised in Germany. And so then I moved to Pittsburgh, Ohio, Pennsylvania, that region, North and East region. And I'll tell you, I'll add to what you were saying, Jeff, I think a lot of people are moving south because the weather, beautiful weather down here in Texas, just from that perspective, if you look at the landscape, the business in Texas, I mean, you know, you have the four major metroplexes here, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, and Austin. They're all part of the top 10 cities of the United States. And it's just an incredible state to do business in. You know, for example, when I lived in Pennsylvania, highly taxed, highly regulated, you have state tax, you have local municipality taxes from an income perspective, right? Where you don't have income taxes in Texas, and so there's a lot of businesses coming down here. I'll give you one example. You know, I'm in Houston now, but I've lived in, in Austin for the past 10 years. There's a road that I drive on. Uh, it's called 130, where I play soccer on Sundays. And um, I drive past the new Tesla uh, uh, building, right? The new factory that they put up. And it's, the highway is 80 miles an hour, and it takes me about 45 seconds to drive from the front of the building all the way to the end. And that's Texas, right? It's very investor friendly. It's very business friendly to come into. And it's one of the greatest states uh, that I've ever live, uh, lived in. So I, I couldn't agree more with this chart, to be honest with you. you know? Yeah. All right, let's 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 jump to this next slide. So, uh, you know, the, the market is in a, an interesting time right now. Rates had a big jump up. But what we're seeing is that there was an initial shock, right? There's an initial shock and how much rates had gone up. But people are starting to become adjusted to that. It's starting to become normalized. And it's not an overheated market. It's not a market where rates are so low that people are just dying to you know, level up a home uh, unnecessarily. But it is a market where people are feeling more comfortable. And that's what the data is showing. So existing home sales jumped 14.5% in February and reversed the 12-month slide. That's a big increase. And it's the largest monthly percentage increase since July of 2020. So, you know, there's some seasonality in there. January is often a slow month, but February is also a short month. You don't have as many days to stretch these sales out. So that's, I think, compelling data that people are starting to become adjusted to which feel to what feels like really high rates. But we'll still a chart a little bit later on. These rates are actually in line with historical norms and really the, the unbelievable rates in the twos and threes over the past, you know, maybe eight years are really unusual. And I don't think people are expecting that as much anymore. They're starting to get used to this different rate environment. Anything else from this slide? Okay. Nope. The um, so, so this is a chart it says new home construction this is one of the highlights. New home construction has biggest monthly gain in two years. Uh, new home construction surged in February. Multifamily projects led the way. So if you look at that chart, all the way back to 1960, basically. Um, if you look over the last 10 years or so, um, you can see we've we've really haven't been building much at all until recently. Um, that was a massive uptake, basically from 2022 up, as new privately owned housing units started units and building with five or more. So um, so these are the, this is basically five plus unit chart. So um, as, I, and I would expect this to continue because as rates stay or increase, who knows, but um, when affordability 
is an issue, multifamily is a is a is where a lot of people turn because it's just cheaper, right? You can you can um, if you're an investor, you can buy a multifamily, you know, like a, a four or five, and these are five pluses, but um, it's easier to cash flow. There's a lot of tenants um, that are wanting to move into rentals because they simply can't afford to buy a new house because of rates. Um, so these multifamily construction projects uh, are on the rise, and I would expect it to stay that way until rates start dropping again. I don't know if you guys see that or have an opinion, but um, this is pretty telling that the, the rates are having an effect on the projects that are being built. Yeah, I think uh, I'll let Marcus, I, I don't know if he had any thoughts here, but I'll, I'll pound real quick. Yeah, uh, I was going to, uh, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, Wade, real quick, right? Looking at this chart, uh, what, what stands out to me, if I look at where, where we're at now, and then I look back, you know, it hasn't, it hasn't had this activity since about 1985, 2020, there's a little spike there, right? A rabbit year. But I mean, this, this is tremendous data, historically speaking, uh, so yeah, this is really, really good opportunity as far as homes being built, put into the market, right? Part of stabilizing and normalizing the market that we're in. The slide before where you said, Wade, right? 6%. I've been in this business for 20 years. That's really what I've been in, in, in a 5%, 6% environment. So this is just a normalizing market that we're seeing. But this is an interesting statistic to help that that along, you know? So this is really good data. Yeah, I think uh, one thing you're seeing is, um, you know, builders are very sharp. They're looking at the data. They're looking at the trends and the the builders are emphasizing the multifamily space. So if you're looking at being a buy and hold investor, that's very telling information that um, while new home construction for single family is is uh, not as, as aggressive right now, um, and that is because it's not as easy always to sell homes. There is a real aggressive move into the landlord space because of Jeff's point earlier that whenever people are, are, are somewhat challenged with buying a home, they have to live somewhere, right? And, and that's going to continue to push people into rentals and multifamily is a big part of that uh, supplying that demand. This next Thanks slide um, talks about the, the increase in building permits in February. 13.8% um, above the January number, um, but it is 17.9% below February 2022. So that is a big, big drop. There's a little bit of an increase over the recency, but a drop overall. Um, you know, in 2022, that February 2022, rates were absurdly low. People, you know, the word was inflation was transitory. So I think the market was really hot. If rates were going to stay that low, then the housing market was going to absolutely boom. If you look, if you compare this to more like 2019 numbers, still a very steady clip, but 2022 was an, a really high time for uh, new new home construction. So I think that you got to look yeah. at context, as Jeff mentioned earlier. You got to look at long-term trends. Yeah, those start between 18 to 20, and the starts are pretty much the same. So it's it's not it's not like it's down, obviously, but it's not that bad, relatively speaking, over over the longer period of time. Next. So these are housing starts and completions. So uh, new residential construction, February 2023, 1.5 building permits, 1.45 housing starts, 1.55 housing completions. Um, so I'll just cover some of the highlights. Privately owned housing starts in February were basically 10% above the revised January estimate, um, but is 18% below the February 2022 rate, kind of like what we were talking about a little while ago. Uh, housing completions, privately owned housing completions in February were 12% above the revised January estimate uh, and is, we'll call it 13% above the February 2022 rate of 1.4. So it sounds like the, they're starting to complete. Um, they're just not starting in as much as much. They've already, these are these are houses maybe that they've already started building. They're coming to market, which is great. You know, it's going to relieve a little pressure, um, but the starts are down. And, and it's not only is it just the interest rates um, that's a challenge, also it's just the cost of materials and building. And I'm not a builder, but for when, when I do talk to those folks, it's just a lot more expensive to build a house. So if you have an increase in the cost to build a house, rates are higher. So it's just a much larger barrier to entry for 
for the average citizen to buy a, a new home. So that's that's the main reason for the slowdown. Good for real estate investors because you, you you know they got to live somewhere, right? So you have you always need tenants. Uh, the rents will go up, is my guess. Um, but this is kind of like referencing back to the previous slide, Wade had. All right. Uh, on the next slide, I'm actually going to cover very briefly, then go to the next one. Honestly, this is just a little bit more of what we've been talking about on permits. You know, the numbers, it, it's interesting to see from 2010, you know, it, it's almost up 3x from 50,000 to uh, 150,000. A lot of that has to do with the net migration and some other attractive parts of the uh, the Texas market. But let's slide right into the next one. This is, I want to get some insight from Marcus on this slide. So uh, these are the 10 markets with the highest projected growth from uh, CoreLogic. And you see that Houston is second. That's a very exciting number. I know you're a recent uh, per a person who's recently moved to the Houston area and, and you do a lot of business here, Marcus. So um, that's a pretty aggressive number compared to the rest of the country other than Miami. But uh, tell me, what are you seeing in Houston that you think is allowing Houston to kind of buck the national trend of home prices not going up as much. Yeah, I mean, I had the pleasure of living in Austin and then comparing it to Houston now. I mean, Austin was uh, like the, the increase was absurd, right? Where Houston is is yes, it's gone up, and yes, it's you know uh, the 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 home values have gone up, and they're doing that now. Whereas in Austin, they're falling a little bit because it was just, it was just too much of a run up in Austin, so we're seeing that come down. But I'm, I'm really happy with what Houston has done. It's been kind of a, again, growing, but more steady eddy, more controlled. And that's why we're seeing this growth now is because the Houston market is, is much more stable, much more mature in that sense. I think Austin was a little bit impacted by, you know, a lot of people coming from California, tech companies, uh, people moving out there for tech jobs. And that really caused some havoc out there with home prices. And they're seeing that the opposite side of it. So good for Houston. Great job. Yeah, I think uh, Houston and, and Dallas in large part, too, have always been a little bit more steady when you look at the long-term trends. Austin, mm -hmm. because of the tech environment, I think it has a little bit of that California uh, more up and down situation. Whenever it's hot, it is smoking hot, right? Just unbelievable. But whenever, uh, you know, any, anything that goes up that quickly must come down a little bit. The good news is if you're a long-term home buyer and, and you're not looking to sell in the next couple of years, Austin is still an amazing market to be in. You know, uh, you just can't, it's got so many attractive things. I was gonna ask you, Marcus, I, I, don't, I don't know if you have any insight to this or not. If you don't, you know, no big deal. But um, I, I do listen to another podcast and they were talking about commercial real estate um, in certain certain pockets of the country uh, where vacancies are just through the roof. Roof. A lot of these, the rates are gone up. Um, it was a really dire situation for large commercial buildings. Do you have any, do you see any of that stuff on the, on your side, on the commercial stuff? Yeah, I mean, I mean, again, the problem is, and it's not really a problem, you know, uh, at Priority, we've always had a work from home model. And you guys know that, right? We have uh, escrow officers, escrow assistants, staff members, team members that are located all throughout Texas. Yes, we have our office staff that's, you know, in the office, but 85% of our team has always worked remotely. But, you know, through the pandemic, having gone, you know, to the work and home environment was nothing new to us, but th that's where the market shifted to. And I think the problem is, and we all know this, right, is people actually enjoy working from home and that puts a lot of pressure on commercial real estate because, oh, wait, why do I have to bury that, that fixed expense of having, you know, to pay rent for an office? when my staff doesn't even want to work in the office. So I think, I think you're seeing, and as you're seeing it in the news now, some people are saying they want to push more people to, to come back into the office for more production, for, for, you know, that having that social interaction with your team members. And so, you know, working from home, you can get a little isolated, but I think that's where it's coming from. Um, so we'll see what happens. You know, there's more companies now going out there saying, look, let's, let's go back and work in the office. We'll see what the what the employment base thinks of that, but I think how that pans out is going to be a direct result on commercial real estate. Um, you know, people reducing office space is going to open that up. Supply and demand, simple supply and demand economic logic. You know. Yeah. 
that's the thing. Like even if a lot of them still do like a, you do a hybrid scum, you just don't need as much space. Even if you do uh, something different, most people don't need that much space like they did. Um, so I'm gonna be curious to see what happened in that space. Mm -hmm. All right, next slide. So this is uh, this comes from the a and Real Estate Center. They do good work. Uh, these are Texas housing prices. Um, you know, single family permits, like we said, down 7% month over month. Um, total home sales up 3% month over month. Uh, median home price is up 2.1. Uh, so under the note there, Texas median home prices started the new year with the strengthening housing market. With 2% uh, month over month rebound was the largest monthly gain since April of last year. So um, yeah, just we talk about this all the time. I think it's, it's a great perspective you're going to have some ups and downs throughout any cycle. Uh, but if you just look over the last 20 years, um, it's, you know, unless you bought in 06 and sold in 10, you know, for the most part, it's, it's hard not to make money. I mean, those are significant gains. Look at where the blue line is or the red line. Look how low it is. It's down to 105 and you're up in the threes now in the last 20 years. So, um, we always talk about, you know, you, it, the, 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 the houses that you regret buying are your, are, you know, that's where you lose the most money because you didn't buy it, right? You haggle over 3,000 or 5,000 here and there. At the end of the day, if you would have bought that house and you held on onto it for these, you know, 20 some odd years, look at your returns. Um, you know, don't, don't get blinded by what's in front of you when the big picture is, it's a, it's a good investment across the board. It's hard, it's hard to screw it up over, over a long enough uh, time period. Yeah, and, and you know what I'll say, Jeff? I, I was really positively um, surprised, and maybe surprised is the wrong word, but I had anticipated more pressure, downward pressure on home prices. But I think the fact that that really hasn't come to fruition is a, is a, is a, is a sign of the strength of the Texas housing market, but also the national housing market. You know, where in 2008, remember the financial crisis, that was sort of built on a house of cards, right? Uh, you know, dicey loans were being made, high risk loans were being made. We're in a completely different foundation. So when prices came down a little bit and they're starting to rebound and you're know, starting moving in a different direction now, I think that's very encouraging and a great sign of the stability of our housing market, you know? So I was very positively happy to see those that, that performance. And there's a great chart to look at that too. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, echo your comment there, Marcus. I think, uh, you know, risky loans last time, a lot of people who had second homes that didn't really need them a lot of negative amortization loans a lot of adjustable rates we just don't have that market right now so when rates aren't adjusting and you don't have negative amortizing loans and people have uh, more savings than they have in the past and and they they're in a pretty good spot on their mortgages overall you just don't have many sellers right and i think one thing that people didn't really uh a lot of people didn't properly anticipate is that you have to have a lot of sellers or a lot of people who are going into foreclosures in order to have a downward market and we're just not seeing that right now. and uh there's not a lot of people who are going to fire sale their home because they really want to hold on to that two or three percent rate like they're going to work really really hard to hold on to that because it's now a thing of the past so i don't think you're yeah. going to see a ton of sellers out there and that's always going to keep the numbers slightly down on sales but i do think you're going to see the value stay steady especially in states with a good economic climate and a lot of debt migration yeah you're saying the volume is way down like the, the the quantity is down but the prices are not down much at all um right. and our one of our other guests jeff smith he always says you know if there's one stat to look at it's uh, months of inventory and if you look at months of inventory, like in order for like things to get really bad as far as prices go, that months of inventory is going to have to go way up relative to what it is now. It's going to have to double, uh, maybe even triple. I don't know what it's at, but I know it's low. Um, so that it's nowhere near, like you said, Marcus, the 08, 09s uh, right now. Yep. Mm -hmm. Next slide. This, this next slide, uh, an interesting point here. If you look at so this this started where uh, the national sales and Texas sales were kind of on a relative balance basis, right? You look at that, like 100 was that number. And over time, you see the number of sales in Texas 
when using that benchmark has just gone up significantly over the rest of the country. But whenever you look at the value increases on the previous chart, Texas has not gone up that much. I mean, it's it's almost increased in line with the rest of the country, but a lot more activity. And a big part of that is because of the inventory that we're able to have in, in Texas. You know, favorable uh, building permit policies, favorable policies for builders. <clears throat> and then you also have uh, a lot of land on which to build. It's an expansive state. So you have a tremendous amount of activity, but home prices is staying relatively stable. And that's a really good market for investors because you don't have to worry over time that like the, the numbers are inflated because of this massive scarcity. It's just not, you know, while there is a scarcity of a relative scarcity of homes, we're not in a state that's like landlocked, like Hawaii, or you just had this total limited space or you can't get permits like in California. I think we've talked a couple of times. There are more permits in both Houston and Dallas each individual municipality than the entire state of California. So whenever you have more homes to move into, you don't have to worry about prices getting completely out of whack and becoming unaffordable, which is a real positive for our housing. Next slide. So um, this is about interest rates, right? So we talked about that a lot. Um, and there's your predictions from different folks. Uh, I thought as I was reading them, it was pretty uniform until I got down to the bottom there. So Compass Bank, um, sustained drop could push mortgage rates into the into the 5% range late in the second quarter, the second half of the 2023. It's not guaranteed, but that was his number in the fives. Long-term rates have already peaked. We expect that 30-year mortgage rates will end 2023 at 5.2. That's a significant drop. Um, nor uh, da, 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 if inflation slows down and this is what we expect rates will stabilize below six uh freddie mac forecast the average rate to be to start at 6.6 .6 in q1 and end at 6.2 so freddie mac is a little more bearish on the rate they think it's going to stay in the low sixes and the realtor um mortgage rates are likely to move into the same percent range over the next few weeks now, that's a very short-term number so I, I don't know how much how much validity that has, but I didn't see anybody talking about projecting that it's going to go much higher, right? Maybe maybe temporarily, um, but they didn't, I didn't really get the sense that you know they're thinking yeah it's going to be in the eights next year. Um, I think there's enough going on uh, in the banking world where they'll probably start kind of slowing the increase, which should hopefully normalize things, um, but. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a, obviously a wide range of opinions, but I would say the consensus is that things will start kind of stabilizing if we go down a little bit by the end of the year. What's your gut, Marcus? Uh, my gut weight is is I agree with these projections. Um, what I will say is, you know, when you when you when you unwind the tape and you go back to last year's same time. Right. None of the projections had us in the four percent interest rate, uh, uh, you know, arena. Right. And then all of a sudden we're at seven percent by the end of the year. So I'm always I'm always a little I always look at it with a special eye when I hear projections about where interest rates are. going. I mean, so much is contingent on it, inflation. But I am very optimistic because we've seen a steady and, and, and normal decline in inflation, a controlled decline in inflation, that to me is very optimistic. You know, it's, it's chipping away at that number. It was at high, I think it was at 9.3%. We're now in the fives. So it's slowly chipping away at it, which tells me there, again, there's a good foundation, there's a good basis. This wasn't a, a major bubble, if you will, right? Um, so we didn't see that. So I do tend to, from my perspective and what I see and what I've seen, is I do agree with, with this. I would think mid fives between fives and mid fives somewhere and there's what i would anticipate and hope for because i think that really gets some great activity going again you know but but i i'm, I'm in line with this considering where we are but again keep in mind i always have a special eye to these projections because at the end of the day there's so many variables that could change that overnight you know that'd be good i mean we're i was just looking at they changed so much i was looking at um bank rate they're basically just just shy of seven percent um but uh, we'll hit the next slide. I did have a comment on interest rates, but we have one more interest rate slide. Yep. Just right, like right, right. Historically, 
And uh, as, as Marcus said, he's been in the business uh, earlier for 20 years. Uh, oh, I think we may have, okay. We'll go ahead and hop on this one. I was looking at that other slide, but uh, historically, you know, we're, we're not out of range of what uh, uh, the long-term numbers have been. The only time it was drastically lower than where we are today is in that, you know, 20, the post financial crisis period. And that was to kind of spur the economy and uh, I think it's a very unusual time. People have been buying houses at far higher rates than we have today throughout America's history, that's for sure. But on this, in this perspective, I, I like this chart because it shows um, from like the 1970s what someone would have paid for a comparably priced home based on interest rates. And as you can see, uh, you know, with 2023 being a benchmark at 2118, the home prices were definitely lower in 2008, 2013, and 2018. But whenever you go before that, 2000, I'm sorry, uh, 1998 and earlier, all of those time frames, people would have paid more to uh, significantly yeah. at different times. So like the times. 70s, so, 80s, and 90s, you're, you would have had a higher payment in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. There's always only the last say, 10, 15, say, 10, 15 years, I guess 20, I'm sorry. The last 20 years where it's been cheaper now you know there's a couple times where it's close but but 30, 70s 80s and 90s it's a long that's 30 years where you're at a much higher clip than, than what you've been at recently yep you know i always find it so interesting right my business partner michael schwartz right we always talk about when he bought his first house he said he had like 13 14 percent interest rate on it so he's seen that level as a homeowner you know, and then when it goes into the twos and threes the way it did, he was just blown away. But to me, the point of view is always interesting, right? Somebody that bought a house in 2020 and 2021, they think that these interest rates right now at six, seven percent are just unbelievably high. But right? it's just the point of view. They don't know how to reference that to something before. And six, you know, a six, five, that's great interest rate. That's what I was talking about earlier. You know, having been in the business for 20 years, that's what I'm accustomed to, you know, and. I'll make a bold prediction. I don't think we'll ever see twos again, <laughs> two percent interest rates. You know? Well, I mean, it, the the result was a lot of, of that, and some other things was a lot of inflation. I think they may have learned their lesson. There's some modern modern monetary theorists out there that thought that you could just do a lot of things and it wouldn't have an impact, but it eventually did. So hopefully, we've learned our lesson a little bit. We'll keep it more in a reasonable range. Never say never, way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, what I do next. hope, you know, for everybody for everybody on the call, what I do hope is that somebody was able, all of us were able to pick up a home and get a two and a half percent interest rate, right? And 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 enjoy the fruits of that scenario. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt. The people well, who have well, it, they, 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 they may not give it up for a while because it's a pretty good rate. If you're not an investor, there are not compelling res reasons to give up that rate. If you're an investor, you know, there are some definitely some compelling reasons. Sorry, Jeff, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. You're the guest. I was going to say on that slide that the point, the point that Wade had made about the estimated monthly payments, I mean, that chart just, just that, that little table there blew my mind, right? When you're talking about high teens interest rates or mid teens interest rates and what their payment was and what that correlates to today at today's interest rate, that's really interesting to see. So that was a really good chart. Thanks for, for, for putting that on there, Wade. That's really awesome. That's a great point. That is not inflation adjusted at all, is it? So a $3,600 payment back then is pretty sporty these days. Yeah, um, sure. What I was going to say was all those predictors about interest rates coming down. I just wanted to remind everybody that's an investor on the phone. We've talked about it the last couple of calls. The prices on the investment deals that we're seeing are significantly lower than they were during the pandemic. A large part of that is because rates are high. People are scared and they don't want to buy a rental property with a perceived high interest rate and the cash flow is diminished. I think that's a mistake. You can always refinance, rates go, uh, rents can go up. Um, but my point is if rates start dropping, those prices, I would guess, will start increasing. So get after it, you know? Now is the time, while the prices are still low and the deals are still good, get into some deals because 
if rates come down, you can refinance, right? If you if you wait until they start going down, everyone else is doing the same thing, and you're going to be competing against a lot more folks, and you're going to pay a lot more price. Yeah, that's a great point. I think the exact number was uh, prior to rate increases, the average investor on a buy and hold property was paying about 90% of the after repairs value. And now they're paying 72 and a half. So instant equity capture on the average deal is like 50K higher. Um, so a lot of people think the market has to come down, like home prices have to come down for there to be opportunities. That, that's a very false uh, understanding. The, the real truth is what matters most is are you getting a good deal relative to the current price? You can't predict where prices are going to go, but you can get a better price at the moment. To just point, uh, you don't have to uh, you don't have to marry the interest rate. Eventually, those rates will come down. You can never change the purchase price that you bought a home at or the percentage of the purchase price you bought a home at. That that can never change. So to just point, the deals are smoking right now, and the savvy investors are really aggressive at the moment. It's more people who might have a fear-based mentality that are not not in the game as much. People who, who are have a uh, like an abundance and opportunity-based mentality. They're really moving in aggressively. Let's look at this next slide. So we show this one a lot. Uh, it's housing starts versus the U.S. population. Um, if if you, you couldn't go, you can go back. This is from like the basically from 1990, and you can go further back, and it's most of the more of the same. Um, the total population is the green line and the privately owned housing starts are the blue line. So, you know, for most of this chart, and, well, maybe half, and but if you go back in time, most of the chart, the blue line is over the green line. Um, financial crisis hit in 2007. We stopped building homes, didn't stop growing the population. We're starting to catch up, but um, that, that this lull, in my opinion, is a, is a large part as to why there is a housing shortage. We just didn't build enough houses over the last 10 to 20 years uh, relative to the population growth. And we've used this chart in the past that goes all the way back to the 50s and 60s. And for the last 10 years, there are fewer homes built than any of those decades, including the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, whenever the population was significantly lower. Oh significant literally more than half of what it is today so there is a dearth of homes and if you're a real estate investor all these factors make uh real estate investment a very long-term real estate investment a very intelligent move for sure let's hit this next chart i really like this one so <clears throat> if you look at rental vacancies and how interest rates impact them if you're a buy and hold investor Vacancy is a problem, right? You're not collecting rent. So you want vacancy to be low. And uh, Jeff mentioned this earlier, but um, <clears throat> people are going to move towards renting properties whenever rates are a little bit higher, right? So as long as you have a cash flowing property, you're going to have lower vacancy. You're going to have people that are, are more aggressively wanting to move in. Lower vacancy means higher rent rates over time. Now, we haven't had as much aggressive rent rate growth recently, but... Um, over time, there definitely is rent, rate, rent uh, price growth in times whenever vacancies are lower. And you look at the last time vacancies were lower, and it was when rates were super high, 70s, yep. right? Then you look now, rental vacancies are very low. When were they When were they higher? Well, they were higher whenever everybody and their brother was getting into a house because rates were lower and, and you didn't have to have... Uh, you know, uh, documented income, and, and as Marcus mentioned, you had jobs, you know, you could do a wide variety of things. So uh, that's that's really an interesting chart. So we, we work a lot with buy and hold investors. We work with flippers as well. You have to be very cautious at the moment on flips, not that you should not do them. You just have to buy at a better price, make sure you're in a really good market and that you are able to repair at a price reasonable to where you can make a good profit in that loan. It's not that you shouldn't do it, just you need to be a little bit more cautious. But the buy and hold environment, vacancies this low in a higher rate environment, it's a really good time because you won't have your property sitting out there nearly as long. Next slide. All right, we have about 15 minutes left. So Houston, um, these were the stats. Uh, you know, if you look at, compared to last year, like more of the same what we've been talking about, um, significantly lower um, volume, right? The 
billion versus 3.5 billion roughly a lot less transactions a lot more listings um we used to always look or i used to always look at the um the acceler the, the basically the pace with which homes were buying so you look at the family home sales in 2022 is 7400 so of the 19,000 listings 7400 sold now look at those two numbers to the right of it they're significantly different uh, the listings are 14,000 more listings, yet there's significantly fewer sales. So uh, the acceleration is not happening like it was. But the good news is the prices are are, are not coming down much at all. You know, two percent on an average, one percent, one point six percent on a median, um, and then the months of inventory, like I was talking about, it is more. Don't get me wrong, but two point six is still a very low number historically speaking. Uh, I believe six is kind of the break-even point when it goes from from a um, seller to a buyer market, and we're nowhere near that. So I think that that months of inventory number would have to go significantly higher uh, for us to start seeing some massive price or sales reductions. Um, yeah, 20, 2022 in, in every situation is a, a very difficult comparison to make because it was literally the houses hottest housing market in history right so uh, i would not look at the 2.6 and say that's a scary number i would look at that and say it's still well below a balanced market and uh which is six as jeff said and if you look at 2019 2012 all these other different times 80s 70s 90s that 2.6 is a very attractive number yeah they, they popped in they talked a lot about and you can read it on hard but they talked a lot about the pre-pandemic comparison you know because it's more of a normal market you know 2019 2018 those were normal markets so that first bullet you know compared to pre-pandemic 2019 single family home sales were actually up seven percent so it's just 2022 is just such a crazy time um now that things are more normal you can kind of look back pre-pandemic and see okay where are we at and relative to where we were before it's still a pretty positive story for houston Next slide. Marcus, not, neither Jeff nor I have ever lived in San Antonio or Austin. So why don't you tell us a little bit about this slide? And, and uh, since you live so close to it, your opinion of San Antonio for real estate investors. So, yeah, and, uh, so we have we have an office in, in San Antonio. We have a lot of relationships with with real estate brokers out there. You know, and San Antonio is an interesting city because you know you have the 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 north and the east which is developed right so it's flowing outwards into those areas and it's it's developed there's a lot of building going on but the west and the south and the southwest are are not you know properly improved there's still a lot of old homes in that so they're 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 redoing San Antonio in a lot of ways and because of that you know there's tremendous opportunity out in San Antonio and it's like its own little world, you know. It's it's a beautiful city. It's a beautiful people out there. Uh, so I think there's lots of opportunity as far as this, you know, particular graph is, uh, chart here is concerned. You see total sales down 70%, average price is up 2%, median price right is up 2%. Close to original list price 93.5. What that means, right, is whatever the home is listed 93.5. It's gonna percent of the time it's at list price that that sells on days on market 70. That's still very low in comparison, right? Price per square foot, no change. Month of inventory, 3.3, not much higher than what we just saw in Houston. To me, I will tell you from, you know, talking to brokers, having great relationships in San Antonio, I hear San Antonio is is, is a really great investor market uh, because so much of San Antonio is in the process of rebuilding and hasn't been rebuilt. So that's my take on it, Wait, from what I know about San Antonio. That's a... I would say the word that we hear from people that have a statewide understanding is that for single family investments, San Antonio is is right up there on par with, with Houston as a very attractive market in that space because the lower price points, but very strong rents. You know, Dallas is a little bit more expensive. Single family can be tough at times. You've got to go into the tertiary markets a little bit more outside of, of uh the major metro there and then austin very difficult for single family investors but those are also great areas for multifamily and commercial as well so yeah i think very similar uh feelings from almost everybody i thought to 
you know, there's something that I can tell you about Austin too that I can kind of relate to that a little bit, right? If if you're familiar with Austin, you know the I-35 highway that splits Austin in half. You have east of I-35, and then you have west of that. When I first moved to Austin in 2012. East of I-35 was was not a very desirable place to be, right? It was, and and they've really done an incredible job over the last 10 years. And if you bought anywhere from 2012 to 2015 on the east side. Man, you are sitting pretty because the whole side on the east side is now regentrified, if you will. And it's, I mean, it's its hip, it's up and coming. That's where people now go to go out. And so that's a lot of things that are happening in San Antonio. The opportunity with that, we have dated homes that have been there for so long. So it's like moving in that south, you know, west, southwest region where it's getting, uh, you know, that, that little makeup, if you will. And to me, there's lots of opportunity just like there was on the I-35 corridor in Austin, you know. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Mm-hmm. In fact, we, we moved over to the Austin slide. Awesome, uh, yeah. Marcus, love to hear you maybe highlight some of this data. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, Austin, again, right, we're we're different little beast. <laughs> so you have your median sales price that went down 12%, different from what we saw in San Antonio and Houston. Close sales is down 17%, which is similar. 84 days on the market, that is... In historical terms, that's quite a, quite a lot for, for Austin. That's a lot of days on market, but that's nothing. That's even below normal levels. And so I'm really happy to see that in the Austin market, it's it's coming back to normal instead of this, this free fall, you know, where you try to make an offer on a home as an investor and you can't, you have no chance. You're just getting outbid and now this investment doesn't make sense. So this is, this is great news here. Uh, while it looks like it's down, but I'm really happy to see Austin stabilize a little bit. You know, new listings are down uh, 1%. That's not dramatic. Active listings up 500%. And that's what we're talking about. You know, there's some people trying to cash out in Austin, trying to take advantage of, you know, the price increase that's happened there over the last 10 years, especially over the last two years, three years. Uh, pending sales are down. Uh, you know, your total sales dollar volume is also down 26%. I mean, that is exactly what we're seeing in, in Austin. Volume is subdued. There's there's no question, but opportunity is starting to rise because you have so many more active listings in the market. And from a title company perspective, like Priority, we love this kind of market because it really comes down to service. Um, and and it's a market where we can shine uh, and we continue to try to do that. But if you ask me, Wade and Jeff, right, I I like seeing this in Austin. This is a much more stabilized market uh, than it has been over the last four or five years. It was just insane. So I'm happy to see this here. I'm really happy to see this. It's funny, like, because I, I just, I read a art, random article, didn't put much credence into it, but I just Googled, like, people moving out of Austin. And it's, according to this uh, this website, seems legit. Um, Austin's in the top four of people moving out now. Like, it's it's got so expensive, people moving out of Austin. Yeah, and, well, and, and I'll tell you there, Jeff, when, when I first moved into Austin, um, for I, th- I think you guys know this, right? Every year, it's like Austin was the number one most desired city, the number one most real estate activity, number one increase in homes. It was always number one, right? And that's exactly what happened. This is a super desirable place. It's When I first drove through Westlake on the west side of Austin, I thought I was in California. <laughs> it's like, wow, this is so cool. Yeah. Um but so, you know, I'm not surprised by that stat because people literally have been outpriced in that market. So another reason why I like seeing these stats here to stabilize that a little bit and bring normalcy back into Austin. I do wonder what the net migration is because I think... Yeah, uh, well, yeah, to be clear, like, I mean, that, was, that was gross. That was a gross number, not a net. So I'm sure there's some people coming into Austin, but... Um, but Until recently, out. there's far more lot. moving in than out. But a lot of people that they just can't afford the taxes, like you know, one of the you know, Texas does have high uh, home tax rates, and some people that have been there for a long time are not going to be able to afford that. As long as you have enough people moving in to counteract that, then that that's an important number. But it is it is tough for people who've been there for a long time, retirees, to be there whenever yeah. you have your home price taxes going up that much. Well, I think it's just different too. You you went from a, a city, I don't know what the size was, say five, ten years ago versus what it is now. It's like a, that's a different it's a different place. And you know, some people just don't like that. For sure. 
All right, uh, next slide covers a lot of the same things. Uh, in the effort of time, let's pop over to the Dallas slide. One more, please. One more, please. Yeah, so D Dallas, uh, home prices are down slightly. So those, those two cities had the biggest increase and they've had the biggest uh, come down a little bit, uh, down 2.8% year over year. Still not a big number unless you just happen to buy right in February of last year, you know, which I don't, you know, that's unfortunate if you did that and you got to sell right away, but I, I don't think most people are in that situation. Um, active listings way up, but still the months of inventory, a very attractive number. The best in, in all the major metros, that 1.7, that's a very, very good number. Even uh, mm -hmm. even Austin, I think, was at 2.3 and not, not a bad number at all versus a balanced market. So um, while there is a lot more active listings, it, you're comparing it a year over year number, which is an unfair comparison. What you really want to look at is that months of inventory, and that's not a bad number at all. That's a very attractive historical number being at 1.7. Look at that. Well, look at that close sales number. Up 15%. I mean, if you compare that to the other cities, that's that's significant. That's very significant. Yeah. yeah. I think they have more inventory that's available now. That's my assumption. That's, 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 that's a lot more listings. I think it was probably a challenge to buy properties there for a minute. Maybe so. The city, the other, the other markets were down. That's that one's up. But just anecdotally, we see we're we're seeing a lot more rental deals. And uh, not Dallas proper, but the general area, right? The yeah. North Texas, great, great market for investors. It is absolutely the, the suburbs there are fantastic, and and a little beyond the suburbs, you know. Yeah. All right, next slide. We got a little bit of time to wrap up. Pretty please. Are you? So this is the affordability index for uh, last year, year over year. So um, when you're comparing this, and you guys, Marcus Wade, feel free to hop in, but you're comparing this, you know, we focus on the yellow in Texas. We primarily do most of our stuff in Texas. Um, Austin was 21 and Dallas was 22. Austin's you know, a little, little more affordable. Dallas is a lot more affordable. Um, Houston as well. You know, so in February, early February, the Texas market was cooking. Um, those numbers, you know, those cities are, are 21, 22, and 29. Now we're 24, 34, and 43. I'm not complaining. Um, I, you know, I, I don't like to be in the upper band because we're talking to somebody. Eventually, cities will hit a point where you just, it's tough to be an investor. You can't buy properties and cash flow in California, for instance, or um, you know, Denver. There's just there's certain markets where it just it's not feasible to buy rental properties for single family and cash flow. So um, you know, Texas being in the 40s and 50s, that's great. That's great for, for our investors. They can find houses that are affordable, they're gonna cash flow and there's still a lot of upside. You know, if I'm buying a property in Miami and I'm hoping I'm betting on appreciation, I'd be a little more nervous because there's gonna be a lot more wild swings than say in the Texas markets where they're a little more conservative uh, as far as the growth goes and it's a little more stable. Absolutely. Um, we happen to look at February, 2019. And uh, you know, uh, I will say that the, the Texas markets were even less uh, affordable at that point. So it's a very nice trend relative to the rest of the country, which is really going to continue to encourage net migration. So uh, anyway, let's uh, let's go to questions. I think Derek says we have a few questions from the attendees. Derek, fire away. We do. I'll jump in here with a couple of questions. Uh, one attendee says, what is a successful strategy for the under Hundred thousand cash to invest in multifamily. Successful strategy with under hundred thousand in cash to invest in multifamily market. Um, well, it just depends on the price point you're going to get in at. You know, uh, there you can certainly be a passive investor at that at that uh, dollar amount. But then also, if you're willing to invest in smaller properties, then that might be enough to really get into that. You know, we have some products that go up to 20 units, um, you know, 
if you're getting at a very good price point and around 10 units, eight units, you might be able to do a deal independently, but it's going to be tough to find deeply discounted deals that you're going to be able to buy a big apartment complex for a hundred thousand dollars. That's really not a viable option unless you're going to work on a syndication or take on a lot of other equity partners. Um, I mean, in all honesty with 100,000, my recommendation would be to follow the model that like a lot of other groups teach like lifestyles unlimited or total wealth. And I think you should really move into single family with that. And yeah. then eventually once you get to five years of appreciation, you can cash out, um, or do a refi and, and move that money into uh, multifamily. But what most people would say, if you've got a hundred thousand bucks, single family is going to be the approach. You can go by, you know, depending on where you find your deals, go buy four or five houses with that cash um, and build yourself a nice portfolio. And then if you, you know, years down the road, if you want to do a cash out refi or sell one or two of them, then you can get a multi if you want to. But to Wade's point, like a hundred thousand dollars, uh, for a multifamily, you're going to be limited with where you can find deals. And um, I mean, we don't do a lot of multifamily stuff, but from it, it's just from what we hear from investors, it's a, it's a lot more difficult to find deals right now for multifamily guys. All right, we've got one more question. What's that, Wade? Just going to say there will eventually be a correction. There are a lot of people that are bridge loans, and there be maybe some attractive deals on the market eventually, but. Um, Yep. I don't see that. Uh, that's going to take a little bit of time to work itself out and uh, just keep keep an eye on it. But I mean, you need to have a strategy. You need to work with a lender. You need to get pre-approved to see what you would even be able to get for a hundred thousand dollars, like what size loan you'd be able to get if you wanted to do a small multifamily deal. And, and any of our loan officers could definitely help you out with that. So if you're interested, definitely uh, reach out to us at the info at Catalyst FDG or go to our website, apply, and we could let you know more about that. Right, we've got one more question um, for the small single family investor wanting to go to secondary and tertiary markets to buy single family homes due to the low entry price. What are the key parameters to ensure you buy in a sound rental market? I would make sure the one thing I would do, and there's a lot of stuff, the, the, the fundamentals are the same. Um, I would make sure you're not buying a rural property. That's different. If you want to go into a smaller town, um, that's fine. But I would stay away from rural properties. They're just tougher to get loans on. Um, we can do them. Don't get me wrong. But uh, I would, I would not want to have a rural property. But other than that, I don't know. Wait, if you have any other tips, but like it's just the basics of making sure you're finding solid deals, right? So you can usually get a little better deals in those markets. There's not as much competition. So not as many folks are willing to go into uh, tertiary markets. So you, you can hopefully get a little better price, uh, but the fundamentals are the same, in my opinion. I'd agree with that, but I, I see no reason to go to a rural market if you're not getting a better price. Like, why, why would you do it if you're not getting a better price? Um, you know, the, the major metros are always gonna be more stable, more jobs, better schools, more amenities. So. The reason to go there is that you can get better prices. We see some very savvy investors doing that and they're out of pocket, you know, half, maybe even 25% of what you would be out of pocket on a normal deal. And that's a very, very good strategy for people who may not be as well capitalized to get into the properties. The other things I just make sure of is that you do have good schools, you do have job opportunities. It's not a market where, you know, there, there's no real job opportunities that and people are not gonna be able to afford the rents you need to charge. But outside of that, I think it's a great strategy, especially for people that may not be as well capitalized or that are looking to buy more deals for less out of pocket. Great, well, I'll close with this. Every time we have a Catalyst Market Update webinar, um, not only do we have a special guest, thank you, Marcus, for being our special guest this thank time. Enjoyed having you. Thank you for having also, me. Thank One you. lucky listener receives half off their next hard money processing fee with Catalyst Funding, and you have to be live on the call to win. Today's winner is Scott McDonald. Yay! Congratulations. Well done. Any closing well, thoughts? Nope. Um, I, the last thing I'll say, Jeff mentioned it earlier, now is a great time to, to get involved. Um, you never want to go start looking for properties until you are pre-approved. So if you would like to start looking at properties, definitely reach out to our team or another lender 
to get pre-approved so you know what you've qualified for and you have uh, interest rate projections to bake into your equation so you can make sure you're getting a good deal. We're happy to talk with you on a um, just an exploratory level or to get you pre-qualified. So definitely reach out to our team if you have any questions. And once again, Marcus and his team are excellent. If you're in a position to choose a title company, definitely reach out and find more about the priority team. Uh, from Thanks. my end, uh, Wade, thank you guys for having me. And then to the to the group, the, the last thing I'll say too is the group at Catalyst Funding, um, I, I've, I, I invested last year, right? I'm not an expert by all means, but what I loved about Jeff and Wade and his team is they're so patient, they're so informative, they're, they care so much that they really had your, you know, your best interest at heart in making some of these decisions. And I think that's one of the things as a client, for example, that I appreciate about Wade and Jeff the most. So if you have any questions, Catalyst Funding is phenomenal. You, whoever you get to talk to, whether it's Wade or Jeff or part of their team, um, so have fun with that. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Marcus. Appreciate you. Thanks, Marcus. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thanks, Jeff. Have a great day. You too.